A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, Chapter 41. One morning I awoke about three o'clock, hearing Catherine stirring in the bed. Are you all right, Cat? I've been having some pains, darling. Regularly? No, not very. If you have them at all regularly, we'll go to the hospital. I was very sleepy and went back to sleep. A little while later, I woke again. Maybe you'd better call up the doctor, Catherine said. I think maybe this is it. I went to the phone and called the doctor. How often are the pains coming? He asked. How often are they coming, Cat? I should think every quarter of an hour. You should go to the hospital then, the doctor said. I will dress and go there right away myself. I hung up and called the garage near the station to send up a taxi. No one answered the phone for a long time. Then I finally got a man who promised to send up a taxi at once. Catherine was dressing. Her bag was all packed with the things she would need at the hospital and the baby things. Outside in the hall, I rang for the elevator. There was no answer. I went downstairs. There was no one downstairs except the night watchman. I brought the elevator up myself, put Catherine's bag in it. She stepped in and we went down. The night watchman opened the door for us and we sat outside on the stone slabs beside the stairs down to the driveway and waited for the taxi. The night was clear and the stars were out. Catherine was very excited. I'm so glad it's all started, she said. Now in a little while it will all be over. You're a good, brave girl. I'm not afraid. I wish the taxi would come, though. We heard it coming up the street and saw its headlights. I turned into the driveway and I helped Catherine in and the driver put the bag up in front. Drive to the hospital, I said. We went out of the driveway and started up the hill. At the hospital, we went in and I carried the bag. There was a woman at the desk who wrote down Catherine's name age, address, relatives, and religion in a book. She said she had no religion, and the woman drew a line in the space after that word. She gave her name as Catherine Henry. I will take you up to your room, she said. We went up in an elevator. The woman stopped it, and we stepped out and followed her down a hall. Catherine held tight to my arm. This is the room, the woman said. Will you please undress and get into bed? Here is a nightgown for you to wear. I have a nightgown, Catherine said. It is better for you to wear this nightgown, the woman said. I went outside and sat on a chair in the hallway. You can come in now, the woman said from the doorway. Catherine was lying in the narrow bed wearing a plain, square-cut nightgown that looked as though it were made of rough sheeting. She smiled at me. I'm having fine pains now, she said. The woman was holding her wrist and timing the pains with a watch. That was a big one, Catherine said. I saw it on her face. Where's the doctor? I asked the woman. He's lying down sleeping. He will be here when he is needed. I must do something for Madame now, the nurse said. Would you please step out again? I went out into the hall. It was a bare hall with two windows and closed doors all down the corridor. It smelled of hospital. I sat on the chair and looked at the floor and prayed for Catherine. You can come in, the nurse said. I went in. Hello, darling, Catherine said. How is it? They are coming quite often now. Her face drew up. Then she smiled. That was a real one. Do you want to put your hand on my back again, nurse? If it helps you, the nurse said. You go away, darling, Catherine said. Go out and get something to eat. I may do this for a long time, the nurse says. The first labor is usually protracted, the nurse said. Please go out and get something to eat, Catherine said. I'm fine, really. 
I'll stay a while, I said. The pains came quite regularly, then slackened off. Catherine was very excited. When the pains were bad, she called them good ones. When they started to fall off, she was disappointed and ashamed. You go out, darling, she said. I think you are just making me self-conscious. Her face tied up. There, that was better. I so want to be a good wife and have this child without any foolishness. Please go and get some breakfast, darling, and then come back. I won't miss you. Nurse is splendid to me. You have plenty of time for breakfast, the nurse said. I'll go then. Goodbye, sweet. Goodbye, Catherine said, and have a fine breakfast for me too. Where can I get breakfast? I asked the nurse. There's a cafe down the street at the square, she said. It should be open now. Outside it was getting light. I walked down the empty street to the cafe. There was a light in the window. I went in and stood at the zinc bar and an old man served me a glass of white wine and a brioche. The brioche was yesterday's. I dipped it in the wine and then drank a glass of coffee. What do you do at this hour? The old man asked. My wife is in labor at the hospital. So, I wish you good luck. Give me another glass of wine. He poured it from the bottle, slopping it over a little, so some ran down on the zinc. I drank this glass, paid, and went out. Outside along the street were the refuse cans from the houses waiting for the collector. A dog was nosing at one of the cans. What do you want? I asked and looked in the can to see if there was anything I could pull out for him. There was nothing on top but coffee grounds, dust, and some dead flowers. There isn't anything, dog, I said. The dog crossed the street. I went up the stairs in the hospital to the floor Catherine was on and down the hall to her room. I knocked on the door. There was no answer. I opened the door. The room was empty, except for Catherine's bag on a chair and her dressing gown hanging on a hook on the wall. I went out and down the hall, looking for somebody. I found a nurse. Where is Madame Henry? A lady has just gone to the delivery room. Where is it? I will show you. She took me down to the end of the hall. The door of the room was partly open. I could see Catherine lying on a table, covered by a sheet. The nurse was on one side, and the doctor stood on the other side of the table beside some cylinders. The doctor held a rubber mask attached to a tube in one hand. I will give you a gown, and you can go in, the nurse said. Come in here, please. She put a white gown on me and pinned it at the neck and back with a safety pin. Now you can go in, she said. I went into the room. Hello, darling. Catherine said in a strained voice. I'm not doing much. You are Mr. Henry, the doctor asked. Yes. How is everything going, doctor? Things are going very well, the doctor said. We came in here where it is easy to give gas for the pains. I want it now, Catherine said. The doctor placed the rubber mask over her face and turned to dial and I watched Catherine breathing deeply and rapidly. Then she pushed the mask away. The doctor shut off the petcock. That wasn't a very big one. I had a very big one a while ago. The doctor made me go clear out, didn't you, doctor? Her voice was strange. It rose on the word doctor. The doctor smiled. I want it again, Catherine said. She held the rubber tight to her face and breathed fast. I heard her moaning a little. Then she pulled the mask away and smiled. That was a big one, she said. That was a very big one. Don't you worry, darling. You go away. Go have another breakfast. I'll stay, I said. 
We had gone to the hospital about three o'clock in the morning. At noon, Catherine was still in the delivery room. The pains had slackened again. She looked very tired and worn now, but she was still cheerful. I'm not any good, darling, she said. I'm so sorry. I thought I would do it very easily. Now, there's one. She reached out her hand for the mask and held it over her face. The doctor moved the dial and watched her. In a little while, it was over. It wasn't much, Catherine said. She smiled. I'm a fool about the gas. It's wonderful. We'll get some for the home, I said. There one comes, Catherine said quickly. The doctor turned the dial and looked at his watch. What is the interval now? I asked. About a minute. Don't you want lunch? I will have something pretty soon, he said. You must have something to eat, doctor, Catherine said. I'm so sorry I go on so long. Couldn't my husband give me the gas? If you wish, the doctor said. You turn it to the numeral two. I see, I said. There was a marker on a dial that turned with a handle. I want it now, Catherine said. She held the mask tight to her face. I turned the dial to number two, and when Catherine put down the mask, I turned it off. It was very good of the doctor to let me do something. Did you do it, darling? Catherine asked. She stroked my wrist. Sure. You're so lovely. She was a little drunk from the gas. I will eat from a tray in the next room, the doctor said. You can call me at any moment. While the time passed, I watched him eat. Then, after a while, I saw that he was lying down and smoking a cigarette. Catherine was getting very tired. Do you think I'll ever have this baby? She asked. Yes, of course you will. I try as hard as I can. I push down, but it goes away. There it comes. Give it to me. At two o'clock, I went out and had lunch. There were a few men in the cafe sitting with coffee and glasses of kirsch or mark on the tables. I sat down at a table. Can I eat? asked the waiter. It is past time for lunch. Isn't there anything for all hours? You can have shukraut. Give me shukraut and beer. A demi or a bok? A light demi. The waiter brought a dish of sauerkraut with a slice of ham over the top and a sausage buried in the hot wine-soaked cabbage. I ate it and drank the beer. I was very hungry. I watched the people at the tables in the cafe. At one table, they were playing cards. Two men at the table next to me were talking and smoking. The cafe was full of smoke. The zinc bar, where I had breakfasted, had three people behind it now. The old man, a plump woman in a black dress who sat behind a counter and kept track of everything served to the tables, and a boy in an apron. I wondered how many children the woman had, and what it had been like. When I was through with the shukraut, I went back to the hospital. The street was all clean now. There were no refuse cans out. The day was cloudy, but the sun was trying to come through. I rode upstairs in the elevator, stepped out, and went down the hall to Catherine's room, where I had left my white gown. I put it on and pinned it in back at the neck. I looked in the glass and saw myself looking like a fake doctor with a beard. I went down the hall to the delivery room. The door was closed and I knocked. No one answered so I turned the handle and went in. The doctor sat by Catherine. The nurse was doing something at the other end of the room. Here is your husband, the doctor said. Oh, darling, I have the most wonderful doctor, Catherine said in a very strange voice. He's been telling me the most wonderful story, and when the pain came too badly, he put me all the way out. 
He's wonderful. You're wonderful, doctor. You're drunk, I said. I know it, Catherine said, but you shouldn't say it. Then give it to me, give it to me. She clutched hold of the mask and breathed short and deep, pantingly, making the respirator click. Then she gave a long sigh and the doctor reached with his left hand and lifted away the mask. That was a very big one, Catherine said. Her voice was very strange. I'm not going to die now, darling. I'm past where I was going to die. Aren't you glad? Don't you get in that place again. I won't. I'm not afraid of it, though. I won't die, darling. You will not do any such foolishness, the doctor said. You would not die and leave your husband. Oh, no, I won't die. I wouldn't die. It's silly to die. There it comes. Give it to me. After a while, the doctor said, You will go out, Mr. Henry, for a few moments and I will make an examination. He wants to see how I am doing, Catherine said. You can come back afterward, darling. Can't he, doctor? Yes, said the doctor. I will send word when he can come back. I went out the door and down the hall to the room where Catherine was to be after the baby came. I sat in a chair there and looked at the room. I had the paper in my coat that I had bought when I went out for lunch and I read it. It was beginning to be dark outside and I turned the light on to read. After a while, I stopped reading and turned off the light and watched it get dark outside. I wondered why the doctor did not send for me. Maybe it was better I was away. He probably wanted me away for a while. I looked at my watch. If he did not send for me in ten minutes, I would go down anyway. Poor, poor, dear cat. And this was the price he paid for sleeping together. This was the end of the trap. This was what people got for loving each other. Thank God for gas, anyways. What must it have been like before there were anesthetics? Once it started, they were in the mill race. Catherine had a good time in the time of pregnancy. It wasn't bad. She was hardly ever sick. She was not awfully uncomfortable until toward the last. So now they got her in the end. You never got away with anyone, anything. Get away, hell. It would have been the same if we had been married fifty times. And what if she should die? She won't die. People don't die in childbirth nowadays. That was what all husbands thought. Yes, but what if she should die? She won't die. She's just having a bad time. The initial labor is usually protracted. She's only having a bad time. Afterward, we'd say what a bad time, and Catherine would say it wasn't really so bad. But what if she should die? She can't die. Yes, but what if she should die? She can't, I tell you. Don't be a fool. It's just a bad time. It's just nature giving her hell. It's only the first labor, which is almost always protracted. Yes, but what if she should die? She can't die. Why would she die? What reason is there for her to die? There's just the child that has to be born, the byproduct of good nights in Milan. It makes trouble and is born, and then you look after it and get fond of it, maybe. But what if she should die? She won't die. But what if she should die? She won't. She's all right. But what if she should die? She can't die. But what if she should die? Hey, what about that? What if she should die? The doctor came into the room. How does it go, doctor? It doesn't go, he said. What do you mean? Just that. I made an examination. 
He detailed the result of the examination. Since then, I've waited to see, but it doesn't go. What do you advise? There are two things. Either a high forceps delivery, which can tear and be quite dangerous besides being possibly bad for the child, and a cesarean. What is the danger of a cesarean? What if she should die? It should be no greater than the danger of an ordinary delivery. Would you do it yourself? Yes, I would need possibly an hour to get things ready and to get the people I would need, perhaps a little less. What do you think? I would advise a cesarean operation. If it were my wife, I would do a cesarean. What are the after effects? There are none. There is only the scar. What about infection? The danger is not so great as in a high forceps delivery. What if you just went on and did nothing? You would have to do something eventually. Mrs. Henry is already losing much of her strength. The sooner we operate now, the safer. Operate as soon as you can, I said. I will go and give the instructions. I went into the delivery room. The nurse was with Catherine, who lay on the table, big under the sheet, looking very pale and tired.